I see that there are, there's a bunch in the chat here. Um, let's see, first thing, the US has successfully murdered civilians of Iraq with no consequences, are these actions justified? How would Anscombe have reacted? <clears throat> so um, the first thing to say about how Anscombe would react is on a case by case basis. Um, so uh, there are at least one distinction that is critically important to her and think she thinks is a, 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 a proper idea from just war theory is whether the killing of the civilians, as I noted earlier, is a mean towards achieving some sort of goal, in which case it's right out all the time because that's simply murder. Or if it is a predictable consequence of a justified action. Now, I would suspect that knowing the details of how the United States involved itself in the Iraq war in the first place, that she would have grave reservations on any part of the um, activities of the United States being justifiable. Um, so if civilians are killed uh, along the way, even if they're not means towards some object objective, that the pretenses that those in charge um, you know, cooked up in 2002 and 2003 in order to go to war would be sufficient for criticizing um, those, those actions. So that's my, my guess as to what Anscombe would say about that. Um, <clears throat> the question, does Jack consent? Uh, so this is back to the example of our, um, who I had depicted as our, our poor guy um, who is uh, about to be killed by one of you in order to have his art, uh, organs harvest to save the lives of five other people. Does Jack consent? I mean, in the setup for the example, uh, Jack, you know, the, the way that we get um, the, what are supposed to be the intuitions regarding the case going, we imagine Jack not consenting. Would it make a difference to Jack if he did, or would it make a difference to the situation if Jack did consent? Um, so I can, I can readily guess that Anscombe with her Catholic hat on would say no, and that this is some sin against God to, to take your own life. Um, but I think the question is more interesting to ask if we imagine Anscombe taking her Catholic hat off, putting her secular hat, which uh, uh, when she puts that hat on, uh, what she would be and what she would advise us all to be are um, Aristotelians of a stripe. I imagine that she would say that uh, part of what it is to be a living being of any sort is to try to live a good full life uh, as a member of the species to which we belong. Um, are there circumstances in which such a sacrifice would count as being a good member of the species? I mean, there's a lot of Greek tragedy that says that's exactly what you should do to go fight for the city state if it's what's called for under the circumstances. And so sacrificing oneself for um, the political entity to which you belong can be the most noble and honorable thing that you can do. Um, so I suppose when we, when we uh, take ourselves out of her, um, her, her Catholic way of thinking about things and think about it from other um, competing ethical worldviews, there are certainly ways of thinking about it being um, possible for it to be uh, a praiseworthy um, sort of thing. So uh, that's, a, that's my two cents on what Anscombe would say about that. I'm going to keep on working through here, and then I'll get John and Howard. Uh, I want to get through the, the, the questions before I lose track of them here. Um, it's a link to the API. Elizabeth says, don't kill Jack. Um, I think the premise that he does not is the choice. Wait, I think the premise. Oh, okay. That's clarifying what I just said. Uh, Roger. So how does one pretend to evaluate the relative values of developing an absolutely perfect per protection from malaria and protecting the world's biodiversity? How can we know what our descendants might think? Great. So if that is a question aimed at um, long-termists uh, in particular and effective altruists more generally, um, then uh, I think it's a good critique, a good criticism 
to raise. Um, as I was suggesting at the end of my uh, take on what Anska might say about SBF, um, in the effective altruism community, there is a great deal of epistemic hubris, a great deal of cult of genius of these wildly smart, um, typically young men who know a lot about moral philosophy, uh, finance, and technology as being the only ones smart enough to solve all of the world's problems. Um, I'm sure that uh, those in this room have heard that some version of that story before in some other uh, vein. I'm, I'm reminded immediately of Enron and the, um, uh, uh, the documentary about Enron, the smartest guys in the room. You know, if only we were as smart as these tech finance geniuses, you know, the, we, would, we they would be able to solve the, the, all the problems. Um, yeah, you know, I, of course, I think that the epistemically humble thing to say is we have no idea um, what these people are uh, going to think and want and, and need. Um, and that the respectful thing to do uh, to future generations is to treat them as agents um, and not just as passive recipients of our uh, benevolence. Um, and treating them as agents means that we should be thinking about the world that we leave for them to be agents in, but also not to make up their mind about everything that we imagine ourselves to know about the future. So I think Roger's criticism is a, a question that can be reconstrued as a criticism is a good one and one that, um, you know, that uh, here, I don't know, I will not pretend to speak on Anscombe's behalf, but I think that that's a, a reasonable thing to say in response. Um, thank you, Rick, for Mark Twain there. I think that uh, Anscombe would, uh, would agree, although I think she might cynically think that a lot of times the intentions aren't actually that good. Um, let's see, last question up here from Ted, and then we'll get to John and to Howard. Are secular laws based upon collective morality? If so, what extent could they form a foundation that Anscombe seems to feel lacking in atheism? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I, th I think that, I mean, Anscombe would, would, would make the point that you're making slightly differently, but this has to just quibbling about the way that the term moral has come to be used. Um, I'll, I'll say it in Anscombe's words, but I think it'll be on to the, uh, onto the point that, 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 that Ted is making here. Um, I think Anscombe would say that inarguably, every system of law is based on some presuppositions about what makes a good human life and what makes a bad human life. And across different times in history and across different cultures, very, it can vary wildly as to what being a good human and living a good human life is. But um, I think that she would say that all systems of laws reflect some uh, underlying views about what being a good human is and what living a good human life is. And her word for thinking about good human living is virtue. Um, and she gets that idea from Aristotle's discussion of virtue. Aristotle says what it is to be a virtuous human being, the Greek word is erite, just means being skilled. So um, uh, LeBron James is a skilled basketball player. Eric Clapton is a skilled guitarist. We can think instead of narrow, limited professions, we can think about just a human life in general. What is it to live a skilled life? And I think Anscombe would say that uh, legal codes of any given point in time reflect what the group of people who have set those codes up think uh, a skilled, whole, good, beneficial life is. Um, so what does she think the uh, uh, ethicists, her fellow ethicists, um, and all those, those non-Catholic ethicists that she's surrounded by, what should they be doing in the seminar room, what they should be doing in their, in their books, what should they be doing in teaching uh, future generations? It's getting people to ask, what does it mean to live a full, human, skilled life? And how can we encourage more people to do that well, be it through uh, law or other, other kinds of aspects of culture that would contribute to people? Um, developing the skills to live well. All right, I am now gonna flip over to the hands and John, you're the first one in my queue and then Howard, you're after John. Yeah, no, no my motive actually, I do have a couple of questions, which uh, two specific questions, which I'll ask later on once the discussion has got rolling. <laughs> one of my main motives was to, just to like transfer from the chats to the, to, to the live questions. So I'll defer to Howard. Um, I'll just make one final remark. Um, 
it turns out that what you and I have been doing on the philosophy of money and the discussion of cryptocurrency did turn out to be somewhat prescient. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it's, so we can claim to have known the future. <laughs> I, but, but You yeah, can claim to I, have I, known I, the future. I will not say anything of the story. I, I, I don't want to go into too much like... Uh, hubris about that because the dangers of it are, are exactly uh, what you say uh, uh, so let's move on to howard great well thanks graham that was that's uh, wonderful really provocative um i'm trying to sort of work around the what the uh, what what feels like a dichotomy between uh, consequentialism and or utilitarianism and some sort of uh, deontological ethics or rule-based ethics um, a lot that came up often when you were critiquing um, when you were offering Anscombe's critique of consequentialism it's it, it sounded to me at times like sort of a rule rule and authority based um, system like these uh, uh, such actions are for these are forbidden or these are prohibited um, and I, I think you mentioned uh, in terms of scriptural stuff like sodomy, idolatry, lying, et cetera, right. et cetera. I mean, obviously, it seems to me, I mean, obviously, that some there's there's room for, let's say, a limited or constrained utilitarianism or rule based, a consequentialist based uh, deontology. I mean, it's hard to provide, it's hard to come up with a utilitarian rationale for uh, ch a child torture or child molestation. It might be easier to come up with a utilitarian utilitarian rationale for uh, a white lie or you know fibbing or shielding someone from the truth um and that uh, i i'm thinking of uh cecilia bach has a book called lying which which i found really valuable just in terms of unpacking um the the um the various situations and gradations of the ethics of truth telling or not truth telling. Um, so I guess maybe my question, I'm interested in hearing more about her secular hat because it seemed to me that maybe from the beginning she was loading the dice against um, a secular ethical system and suggesting that we need a rule-based a rule-based absolutism if we're not to you know be tempted down the, the slippery slope of um, you know the crudest forms of of utilitarianism that might um uh, uh that might neglect or or throw out the uh, you know throw out any source of hu uh, human decency with the uh, with the consequentialist bathwater if i can put it that way yeah great um <clears throat> uh thanks for that um so uh, there's a lot to say in 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 response to um uh, the remarks and and the question. Um, let me focus on the so, the kind of secular view that she imagines for her contemporaries to have, who are not going to wear Catholic hats or Catholic anything. Um, what their source is, and then how that gets to be uh, an argument for there still being um, prohibited classes of action, um, even in the absence of a lawgiver. So um, I've mentioned this a couple times already. Um, she advocates for uh, a return to Aristotelianism, which uh, those of you who have um, encountered, and I think probably maybe everybody in the room have encountered any sort of um, introduction to uh, ethics textbook or course in the 20th or 21st century um, will be um, probably more than likely will have been introduced to the idea that there's three ways of doing ethical philosophy. There is consequentialism, which again, Anscombe invents the term here. Uh, there is deontology, which is a rule-based or law-based ethics. But then there's a third way known as virtue ethics. And <clears throat> Anscombe is responsible for the term consequentialism, and she's um, uh, jointly responsible with a couple of her colleagues at Oxford in the middle of the 20th century for thinking about virtue ethics as a category um, um, at all uh, for thinking about um, what it is to do ethics. And virtue, virtue ethics in its 101 guys, um, you're told that what's different about virtue ethics compared to consequentialism and deontology is that it's focused on um, the whole life of an individual rather than on particular actions. And is focused on the question of what it is to live a whole fulfilling life 
as opposed to maximizing the consequences of what one does, consequentialism, or following the moral law. It seems like we can separate out the question, what is the moral law, assuming that there is one? What does it de determine that I must do? And what does it prohibit me absolutely from doing? That that's a separate question from, how will this action contribute to the, my well-being and happiness overall? That we can pull those two things apart. And so um, uh, I, I, would, I think that probably there's plenty of people who describe themselves as virtue ethicists or proponents of virtue ethics who um, uh, don't want anything to do with um, anything deontological or law-like at all. But from Anscombe's perspective, um, there was always going to be um, uh, a space in virtue ethics for moral prohibitions. And the reason is that, or her argument such that it is, is uh, where do we get the idea of virtue ethics from? She says, although no one has articulated it more clearly in the Western tradition than Aristotle. Did Aristotle, when Aristotle is, is listing his virtues, um, uh, courage, moderation, uh, beneficence, uh, wit, and the like, what's a consequence of that? Well, it, it, it gives us different categories of actions. Virtues, first and foremost, are like psychological states that allow us when danger uh, approaches us to do the courageous thing or when we're tempted by too much cake or beer or something like that to be moderate and, and, and not, not give in. Well, what we do as a function of having that psychological state then is uh, falls under the classification. Uh, the action that we perform is then classified by the virtue that we that we perform. So Aristotle presents a worldview in which, like, what it is to be human is to already be living in a world where we go, where we are classifying our actions. Like, what it is to have virtues is to have categories of action. Um, just fall out of the fact that we think that certain character traits are good to have and certain character traits are bad to have. Now, it's a short step from there to saying, are there any of these categories of action that no, that a good human simply would not perform because it would, contribute, it would not contribute to a good life? It would make one worse as a human. You'd be a bad human if you perform this kind of action. And Aristotle's got a list. They include the, some of the things that show up on the Catholic don't list, which includes adultery and murder, et cetera. Um, so um, <clears throat> the result of, of that then is a virtue ethical perspective that doesn't involve any kind of, of law giver. There's no one out there writing down laws, prohibiting classes of action, but rather reflection on what it is to be a good person and realizing that a good person just wouldn't lie to their friends or just wouldn't bear false witness uh, against anybody. Um, now, that's he's like- an the, the, He's an that's, empiricist too, right? He's looking around him and he's seeing, uh, you know, what functions uh, socially. Yeah, and, and right. And potentially so, dangerous socially. And so there's a consequentialist element to that sort of uh, empirical basis so there, so for arriving with, at virtue. Correct. The, 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 um, and Anscombe, uh, if you want to see where Anscombe talks about this, it's in uh, her reflections on how um, uh, the, her reflections on promising and how the expectation that one will, not just the expectation, but the, um, uh, the requirement, the moral requirement that one, ought, that one will keep one's promises, where does that come from? And uh, uh, she does, the argument that she gives is something like conventions arise. Some of them turn out to be really useful. The really useful ones, we, when we see how beneficial they are in our lives, they change from being merely useful conventions to having the status of being necessary. Um, and bam, don't lie is, is how you get that. Um, she would hesitate, I think, to call it consequentialist because when she invents the term consequentialist in this essay, she has in mind this very narrow idea that when one is engaging in um, either practical deliberation or the assessment of, of actions, one doesn't think about the means ends relation, the, the mean, one doesn't think about an agent as positing an ends and then taking a means to it. Like that just completely falls out of the picture. All that one thinks about the agent is doing is predicting what's gonna happen and then trying to bring about the best predictions. That's the sort of psychological view that she wants to uh, critique. 
<clears throat> since she wrote, the term consequentialism has come to mean something much, much, much more broad than that. Understandably, the word consequentialism makes you think like, well, we're just thinking about consequences. And doesn't she herself argue then that the value of promises is the consequences that it provides for a society that picks that up? Sure. I mean, I, I you know, uh, uh, um, that's, that is true. And I, I mean, I, I don't know enough about her later writings to know whether anyone pressed her in this way, because again, of, as you're pointing out, the like broadening of the term consequentialism over, term, uh, over time. Um, anyway, I'll stop there because I, I think that that addresses a, a quite a few of the things that, that have been said. That was uh, great. Henry, Thanks so much. Sure thing. Henry's hand is up and then I'll get back to the chat. Henry, go for it. Henry, you're still muted. Uh, please, please unmute. Uh, how about now? Better? Great, can hear you now, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, my question is about the moral side of the philosophy. Let's say we, um, we have a person who is absolutely believes that uh, his actions are justified for the sake of the end. So I'm saying what the actions, the means justifying the end. And uh, for example, it's a holy war to say it's a jihad holy war and, uh, and also lies. So the person believes that absolutely that the, his actions are per perfectly fair in order to justify the higher goal. And no doubt about it in his mind. So how do we look at the, how do we apply uh, as for philosophy to this situation? As I said, no doubt in the person's mind, he commits the act, he thinks this act to the best, or for example, uh, like Nazis during the Second World War. Uh, well, they wanted to improve the humanity by eliminating mentally de deficient, being mentally, physically deficient individual, the deficient human. Again, they believe that this is a good thing. So my question is, if the person absolutely believes that doing this thing is a good thing for the sake of the end. How do you apply uh, social philosophy to this situation? Great. I think this is a, um, an excellent question to ask uh, because I know some things that Anscombe explicitly says on the matter, but it's also a spot where um, I think it opens some questions about what it would have meant for her not to be Catholic. Catholic her thinks that she's got an answer. The Catholic Church is just right. So if the Catholic Church says do something, do it. And if it doesn't, does don't do it. Um, but again, she's operating in the 20th century. So she knows that simply saying that is not going to be persuasive to um, uh, the majority of her of her colleagues. You know, something I've never thought of before is I wonder, um, and this kind of, maybe this will go somewhat to Elizabeth's question. How do you think the World War II influenced Anscombe's position on atheism and Survivalism, um, you know, I, I don't know, but it, it um, uh, she did talk not just about Truman, but about Nazis, who I'll circle back to in just a second. But this way of 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 um, of, uh, of critiquing atheists and saying that they ought not use the term moral anymore in their deliberation seems to point in one of two directions. One is like a kind of relativism that is like threatens to tip into nihilism, but maybe she never worried about that because she just was so convicted in her Catholicism and thought that anyone who could have, you know, the truth revealed to them would become Catholic and it, it would all, it would all be good. Um, I mean, I can't believe she would be so naive to think that, but maybe it's easier to take these really hard lines on secularist ethics if you think if you're already so convicted in your in your Catholic position, I'm not I'm not entirely sure about that. But to the question about what do you say to um, someone um, uh, a, 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 someone who is devoutly committed to jihad or to Nazism, who thinks that it is God's will that they kill certain people, or in the case of uh, of the Nazis, the the will of the state um, or whatever, uh, in order to, to to kill some people to to bring about some ends. So she's got this um, uh, very specific example that she gives near the end of intention where she is um, 
talking about the um, teleological instrumental character or action and um, what it is to perform good actions and bad actions and what makes an act good or bad. And she's very worried that people can't hear the question, what makes an action good or what makes an action bad without importing ethical notions to it. So she says, like, let's imagine a Nazi on his dying day. He's loading up a mortar to go fire on a school full of Jewish children, um, you know, and we confront him. What do we what do we say to him? Um, and I think that she works with this example in order to show that if we were going to try to reason with such a person at all, telling them that it's bad to be a Nazi at this stage of the game probably isn't going to get very far. And moreover, telling them what a Nazi should or shouldn't do definitely isn't going to get very far. They're a Nazi. They know what uh, good Nazi actions are and what bad Nazi actions are. So what would we do to reason with such a person if we find ourselves in this awful predicament? And she says, <clears throat> well, any human life, she doesn't put it quite this way, but all human lives are marked by multiple identities. You know, not only is the Nazi a Nazi, the Nazi is a person, presumably a family member to somebody. Um, they're a, a German citizen outside of being a Nazi. There's multiple descriptions that we bring ourselves under. That's just part of what it is to be uh, a human, is to have multiple different um, correctly applying identity conferring descriptions that we can bring ourselves under. So Anscombe's like, you know, you really want to try to stop this Nazi from doing something and you don't just like take him out or take his mortar away from him. You might reason with him like, okay, yeah, it is your dying day, but what are some other things that it befits a good Nazi or a good German to do on their dying day? Do you have to fire this mortar off at the Jewish school? Maybe there's other th some things that you could do that would be fitting for you as belonging to this kind. Um, <clears throat> are you going to succeed? Who knows, right? Um, but it, it does uh, draw our, I think it, it, it's Anscombe's own answer and intention, and it draws our attention to the fact that, um, uh, you know, our, our, what we are doing at any given point in time falls under one description or is a result of one description that we bring ourselves under, um, but in many different circumstances, we could think of ourselves under different descriptions, which is just to say, think about different identities that we have and do something else that is fitting of that identity rather than something as uh, um, horrible as the kinds of actions that, that, that we've been talking about. Uh, what, 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 I, what actually I was aiming, uh, yes, uh, it's great, but the question is, is moral rule, the morality itself, is it absolute or relative? That's that's the, the bigger question. Yeah, that... great. Yeah, okay. And um, so to that question, I think that the answer is Anscombe the Catholic thought yes, and mm -hmm. the morality is what the Pope says. But if we're not Catholics like Anscombe, but think that modern moral philosophy and intention um, teach us something about human life, human action, human society, I personally find it very difficult not to become, um, uh, I'll put it this way, uh, I hesitate to use the word relativist, so I'll put it this way, a non-universalist, right, that our, our, um, our ethical codes derive from the historical moment in the culture, uh, the historical moment we find ourselves in the culture to which we, we belong, that there's no like, there's no getting outside of that to something more universal. I think that maybe, again, the reason Anscombe thought that she could get outside of that to something more universal is precisely because she was Catholic and thought that the Pope was channeling God to her. Um, yeah. I, I find, uh, um, I just personally, the argument here in moral modern philosophy pretty persuasive that if you don't want to go that route, then you're not going to get, um, as it were, normative footing any stronger than the norms um, of the of the cult jurors, historical moments that you belong to. Um, there's nothing in her philosophy anyway that suggests there's any way to get to something universal except for, um, you know, the stuff that doesn't show up in modern moral philosophy and intention, the stuff that shows up in her Catholic writings about becoming Catholic. Okay, we've got um, a handful of minutes, a handful of questions. I see two hands up and then I'll come back and close out with the chat. Uh, Roger, your hand is up. Yes, thank you. I was really going to say something like 
what Henry Himmel has said, because it seems to me that, uh, I mean, I don't care what the Pope says. I don't, it's, it's irrelevant to me. I, only, I, I can only say for me what is good or bad and don't see how anybody else can do any more than that for themselves. I mean, I imagine that the invasion of Ukraine was uh, prompted by people who thought it was the right and moral thing to do. I disagree. How can one make an evaluation of that? I mean, it, it, it's Al Qaeda and, the, uh, and people of that sort who have completely different value sets from mine. And not, nothing that's been said by Ansco or anybody else, as far as I can see, is resolving that problem. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so the her her uh, great. Um, uh, I'll, I'll use that as an opportunity to maybe clarify the point that she makes about Nazis as a, an intention. Um, I think that uh, the reason or the reason that she depicts the thing to say to a Nazi on a Nazi's dying day, um, uh, the way that she does is that you're not going to be able to show the Nazi that they have uh, the wrong worldview or mistaken worldview. The best that you're gonna be able to do is to show that they're more than just a Nazi and that there are other things that they might do according to some other aspect of their identity rather than fire the mortar off at the, at the school. But the reason right. that the fact, the fact that she argues in that particular way makes me think that she agrees with you. Like you're not, you're just, you're not going to demonstrate to someone who is deeply convicted by a worldview that their worldview is, is wrong. You're not, that's not something you're gonna argue them into. Well, they're, they're trying, they would perhaps argue that I am the one who's got the wrong worldview. I mean, right. uh, and I know that I've, I know I've got the right worldview, but they know they've got the right worldview. And there's nothing that anybody has said that I can see and uh, is going to change that position. Right. Mm. Um, Sorry, thank you. Hand up is Unreal Tereshev. That's me. Um, uh, You what? You um, turn on my camera. Great, thank you. So um, I don't know if this is a kind of a gauche statement to say anything, but I think that uh, her statement that the Pope uh, is the fundamental basis of like morality has a very interesting parallel with um, uh, some Nietzschean existentialist idea that. Um, uh, that morality was a tool utilized by the ruling ar aristocratic class in order to uh, further their own goals. Um, I, um, so it ultimately, um, so from my understanding of the thing, um, that's probably the most important tool that the ruling class has to um, uh, impose their will on the on the people. Uh, so um, my other, I also have another question about that whole Nazi thing and the whole mortar thing. Um, what, what if instead of like a Nazi who, um, which we already know probably has like this complicated uh, like backstory and a complicated morals. Uh, what if we imagined uh, like an arbitrary, uh, mortar launching machine that had um, like some level of sapience uh, uh, because of its own like single-minded focus on like the mortar thing and like not nothing else to appeal to um, is it completely uh, does that lead to the conclusion that it would be completely pointless uh, to uh, argue with that and therefore uh, argument is completely impossible with it and therefore it cannot uh, be judged on the basis of morality, uh, meaning that, like, at least for her, her perspective, um, the moral capability of an object is in some way based on, like, complexities, and that, like, it, the only way an object can be moral is if uh, it would be possible through exterior means to convince it to do uh, something that wouldn't be moral, or I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah. So the 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 object that you're imagining is like a as a, a robot of some sort. Yeah. 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 So um, great. Um, uh, and the 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 following maybe she would get from her Aristotelianism, but I think that um, you know, we we've only mentioned Wittgenstein at the very beginning, but I'll I'll bring him back up again here. Um, <clears throat> She, uh, I think that she would think that something that uh, performs some kind of calculation in order to figure out how to kill as awesomely as it can, um, if it's if it's not uh, the kind of being that's engaged in um, the process of giving and taking reasons with other reasoners, namely other humans, if it doesn't involve in that, um, if it doesn't involve itself in that kind of process, if in fact it's incapable of involving itself in that sort of process, then whatever it is, it's not a, it's not a human. It's not a one of us. What we do as humans is what we're doing right now in this Zoom, which is putting ideas forward, asking questions of those ideas, responding to those questions, but being sensitive to the back and forth between questioning and answering and being sensitive to what counts as a good reason to a question and what counts as a crappy reason for a question. Um, if your robot is not doing that, then yeah, I imagine that she's going to say it's just a machine. And if it's killing things with such great efficiency, we would probably do well to, to break it or disassemble it. Um, so there's a, there's a um, <clears throat> part of that comes from Wittgenstein's focus on what language use is and what language use making humans what they are. But it also goes all the way back to Aristotle, who said that this is what distinguishes us from the other social creatures like wasps and bees, is that we, uh, Aristotle says we use language with an eye to justice, which is a very specific way of saying something more general, which is we use language to ask each other what we think is good, give reasons for thinking that something is good or not, and then coming up with plans and projects in order to, to execute them. Now, if your robot could do that, I think it's much uh, harder to say it's not in a lot of relevant respects like one of us, and we got to ask different questions about it. Um, but if all it's doing is just like very sharply calculating how to kill effectively, and it's not involved in uh, the game of giving and taking reasons, it's not going to be, uh, it's, not a, it's not a one of us that would fall within the scope of her concerns about morality. Okay, um, I am uh, going to, because John told me that this was the time to call a pause to things and reading over the chat, it seems I'm seeing more questions, or excuse me, more comments than questions. Um, I'm gonna hand it back to John or Ala to officially call it to an end, but then invite anybody who wants to stay after for a bit to, to chat and the recording's off. So. John, Ella, you out there? All right. Thank you, Graham. That was excellent and very provocative and deep anal philosophical analysis. I really appreciate me and I'm sure all our members. So uh, next month, our speaker is going to be Henry Chosovsky. And the topic is Shopping Hour, the world as will and representation. <laughs>